Hello, everybody. Bonjour, konnichiwa, guten tag, ciao, hola, ni hao, o aloha, salam. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to another uh, global immuno talk where we have an ex extraordinary special guest today, uh, Dr. Jim Allison, who, who needs no introduction to, to the field, but I'll give you some um, uh, background on, on Jim and his life because he's got a very interesting life and, and career, one of the most uh, illustrious and, and uh, distinguished scientists in the field of immunology. So uh, Jim was born in, you know, in Alice, Texas. So he's a Texan, has been born and raised and, and uh, loves Texas. He started his career in, uh, at UT Austin. Then he moved to Berkeley where he became a full professor and HHMI investigator. Went on to uh, move on to Sloan uh, Cancer Center, where he was a chair of immunology, and then wound his way back to, to Texas again uh, at MD Anderson. And he's now the Regental Professor and Chair of Department of Immunology, Vice President of Immunology, Executive Director of Immunotherapy Platform, Director of the Parker Institute for Cancer Research, Deputy Director of David Koch Center for Applied Research and Genitourinary Cancers and the Olga Keith Weiss Distinguished University Chair of Cancer Research. I don't think, Jim, I've ever heard anybody that has more titles <laughs> than that. Um, he's a very busy person. He's also now the founding director of the James P. Allison Institute, which was established a couple of years ago and is um, going to be a leading uh, institute in cancer immunology. Doc, uh, Jim has spent a distinguished career studying the regulation of T-cell responses and, and developing the new strategies for cancer immunotherapy, as we, we all are aware of. He earned the 2018 Nobel Prize, uh, for which he shared that with Dr. Tasuko Hanjo for their discovery of cancer therapy by inhibition of negative immune regulation. And as we all know, his most notable discoveries in the pioneering, the understanding of how the T-cell receptor signals, its structure, how co-stimulation, the discovery of CD28, and how CTLA-4 operates uh, to inhibit CD28 signaling and how that regulates T-cell activation, autoimmunity, uh, uh, and anti-tumor immune responses. And obviously that were, were some of the most seminal findings that paved the way to his work for developing the first immuno checkpoint blockade molecule and antibody against CTLA-4 that was approved by the FDA and has gone on to now save the lives of many uh, cancer patients. He's also received other notable awards, of course, National Academy of Science, the Lasker Award, Tang Prize, and many others. But Jim, we all know that you are a musician. You love to play the harmonica. Many of us have seen you uh, play the harmonica at meetings and you are an extraordinary musician. And so I wanted to share this slide for those of you who may not have seen Jim uh, himself playing the harmonica. Uh, this is a, a, a slide that I've been able to see some of your own personal videos of uh, playing uh, the harmonica on stage with Willie Nelson. Here's he, he's also in this other picture on the right getting the Nobel Prize Award. So Jim, I have one personal question before I ask our global immuno talk question. Which are you more proud of? <laughs> Uh, no, I don't know. It's pretty much a thrill uh, playing with Willie. Um, uh, so I don't know. I'd rather not take a stand. Yeah, I'm just, te I'm just teasing you. Of course, <laughs> we're so proud of both of you uh, for both uh, both your musical um, talent and, uh, of course, your scientific talents. Um, so the uh, talk we would like our our listeners to hear from you. I mean, the question we'd like to have our listeners hear from you today um, is. If you were to think back on your career and you maybe made a decision that was the most pivotal in influencing your scientific career, what would that be? I think it was the most pivotal and the most dangerous at the same time, I think, was when I, due to hard work of a number of people in the lab, you know, when we, we came up with the notion for our CTLA-4 blockade, uh, you know, before there were checkpoints, from C4 was the first, and and you know, as, as having dabbled in the field for about a decade before that, and just seen sort of marginal responses and stuff, and when we showed that almost any tumor that we we threw this out, it would just wipe out; they just melt away, and the mice were immune. And I've never seen anything like that before, and was convinced that you know this really had to go to the clinic, and met with a lot of opposition there, and. Uh, 
Um, and so I devoted close to four years, really, I would say. Um, my friends all talked about how, I don't know, fanatical I was about it. But I, but the thing that happened that, that made it a pivotal decision, I think, was that I got so focused on that, you know, some of the other work slid and and I kept doing more stuff here rather than, you know, my usual thing, which is to dive deeper and move move on. But um, it was one of those things where if I if, if I won, I won. If I didn't, I was done for, you know, you know <laughs> that would have been the end of my career. Uh, but, you know, luckily, you know, it worked out. So I found somebody that would help me get into the clinic. That was the whole deal. There was so much contempt for the notion of the immune system in immunology, the, the, the immune system working in cancer therapy at the time, people just laughed at it. Even even a lot of immunologists would yeah. score you know, saying, well, Jim's a <laughs> immune, tumor immunologist. You know? But I think that that was probably the most pivotal. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, well, we're excited to hear your talk, so please go ahead and share your screen and and we'll go forward. Okay, I think my screen. Where have I lost it here? There, there we are. So what I want to do today is um, is really um, concentrate on on just one thing really, and that that's just talking about the mechanisms of CTLA four and PD one. Um, there are these two major checkpoints now. Some minor ones I'll get to briefly at the end, but um, in the clinic because PD one had had fewer and less severe overall immune-related adverse events in patients that were treated, it became the dominant one. Uh, but we pursued this from a more of a fundamental immunology uh, view, uh, looking at, at, at uh, really how it works, the kind of cells that are involved, the, some of the signaling that's involved, its effect on uh, uh, indirect effects on, the myel on myeloid cells, and finally, just the inherent uh, properties of, of memory that are associated with initiating these two kinds of therapy um, on, on T cells, taking it completely out of the context of tumor immunology, just asking, okay, what do these do to memory and memory development through the mechanisms I'm sure everybody on this call is aware of. Uh, so, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, here my, um, mine and uh, my, my spouse, Pam Sharma's um, um, disclosures. Um, the work I'm going to show today, I always have to thank Max Crummel and Alan Corman. Max, who uh, was a graduate student, was the one that showed CTLA-4, was a negative regulator. Then Alan, who helped us get over the top and making the, helped us make the ipilimumab antibody. It, it was the first clinical uh, reagent. Uh, the work I'm going to show you today is largely due to, to three postdocs, actually largely due to two, uh, Spencer Way and Stephen Mock. Um, and I'll acknowledge others as I go through with the constant work of help of, of Pam Sharma and also with the immunotherapy platform uh, at MD Anderson. So as Sue said, you know, we began, I began in the 80s actually by work, trying to look at how, how T cells were activated. Um, after showing the structure of the T cell receptor, the field quickly became aware that that's not sufficient to activate a T cell. There are additional signals that they called it, you know, co-stimulatory signals required um, without going into all the details. We, after a few years, showed that um, the major, if not the uh, only one that fits the criteria of a second signal required for to turn on a naive cell to prevent a clone from becoming energic is, is CD28. And others show that the ligands were B7 molecules and only um, subsets of cells, notably, of course, digitic cells can, can do that effectively. And, and when a T cell gets those signals, it turns on all this stuff uh, that allows it to enter cell cycle progression, um, turns on um, survival factors, turns off inhibitors of proliferation, so the cells begin to proliferate. You have to do that, of course, because you know the 10 to 10th or 10 to the 11th, uh, whatever number of different clones you have, only a few uh, get activated by any given tumor or virus, if you will. You've got to generate an army, so they've got to divide. And so that, that's what that's all about. Um, but this other molecule that, that we started working on because it's been cloned by others, but its function was really not known, CTLA-4 quickly reared its head because it's structurally homologous to, to uh, CD28. 
and Peter Lindsley showed that it reacted with the, the same ligands as, as, as CD28. So that led some interest into it. it was, and first it was thought it was another gas panel, you know, like, like CD28, but it quickly became clear through, through Max's work that it actually inhibited um, T cell proliferation. And, and, and um, so we began studying its anti um, tumor properties. But later on, we found that it's even, it's not just something that you exploit there. It really is fundamental in terminating the proliferative phase. You know, at the time we were doing this work, people thought it was just activation induced cell death. That, of course, does something fast mediated cell death. Uh, but when you get rid of those, there's not a hell of a lot of impact on immune response. But when you get rid of CTLA-4, it's lethal. Um, you know, the mice die when they're about three weeks old. So TACMAC and only Sharp and, and, and uh, my lab uh, showed that, all showed that at about the same time. Uh, and and uh, the way it works is basically by reversing a lot of the things that CD28 does. But it comes on, the level of the protein accumulates. There's a lot of controversy in how it works. We think it just outcompetes because it's got about a three log or so higher avidity because of some structural peculiarities of, of, of CTLA-4 CD, CD compared to CD28 and just outcompetes CD28 for the B, no, B7 molecules and just shuts it off. In any event, with that tumor context, we've been doing a lot of work showed that um, the tumors failed to elicit immune responses, not because they lacked antigens, uh, but because they couldn't co-stimulate. We put B71 or B72 into a number of tumor models and, and tumor, tumor um, in mice and showed that that made them completely immunogenic, induced immunity. Um, and so uh, that wasn't the problem. And so this led, gave rise um, to, to, to this model that we began working on. And that is that, you know, CTLA-4 is going to come up in every immune response. It's hardwired to do that. Its job is to do that, to stop proliferation. Uh, but that once it starts coming on, it's a race. And if you generate enough T cells to take care of the tumor, which has had a head start, then, you know, the, the immune system wins. But if, if you don't, then the tumor wins. And so we had the idea of just taking the brakes off with an antibody might allow um, the immune system to just keep going as long as you needed it to. So, um, so, so we carried out some early experiments that worked in almost every tumor model um, that we did. Uh, I'll show one in a moment, but there were two things that were you know, just um, scientifically compelling too. One of them is that we're not treating the tumor, the tumor's over here. We're actually treating the immune system, immune cells, you know, uh, an inhibitory molecule on T cells so this could work against any kind of tumor um, effectively. But the other thing is, since all this priming starts uh, with necrotic cell death and activation of the innate immune system, uh, when you kill tumor cells, or when you provide a vaccine, or you kill tumor cells with chemotherapy, radiation, whatever, you're going to start that process, but CTLA-4 is going to shut it off. So and you could also very readily use this as combination therapies. And this is happening now. Um, um, so it'll you know, come to you later uh, in combination. So, you know, it could give uh, memory and polyvalency and all these things that, that immune uh, therapies have, that conventional therapies uh, don't. Uh -oh. So this just shows one of our earlier tumor experiments. This is an experimental tumor growing on the backs of mice. If we injected blocking antibodies to CD28, you can see the tumor grows faster showing but there is a nascent immune response, you just can't get it done. When you inject anacetylate 4 molecule antibodies, the tumor grows for a while. But then I think as the T cells accumulate, um, it begins to you know, take the tumor out, uh, it vanishes, and those mice are, are immune for, for the rest of their lives. So very effective. We did this in a lot of different tumor models. And even this led to a phase three trial. It was, it was a survival um, overall survival is the end point. It, was, it took almost five years. It was finished in 2010, and it was in stage four melanoma. And just to put this in context, this is untreated. This, these are uh, placebo controls, which was not unethical in those days. There was no standard of care for melanoma. No drug had ever prolonged survival of melanoma. The median survival was about seven months. Uh, in 2011, after diagnosis, that's just what it was. Fewer than 3% of patients were alive at five years. Anyway, you can see here this top line 
um, is the IPI control. And you can see that it moved that median survival over a few months. But the cool thing is it also flattened out here at about 20% after about two years. Uh, anyway, this alone would have been sufficient for FDA approval because no drug had ever done that. But this tail was really intriguing. Um, an interim study a few years after that, on a total of almost 4,000 patients for whom there was 10 year survival, showed that this survival, again, this monotherapy lasted for about at least 10 years you know, in patients that had received uh, ipilimumab antibodies. Um, but why is it 100%? You know, I could give you some mechanistic reasons for that, but one of the obvious ones, certainly more interesting one scientifically, was there was another checkpoint. And uh, Tosca, as Sue mentioned, who had been working on a molecule called PD-1 that he had, he had cloned and thought played a role in negative regulation and thymic selection, hence the term program death one. Uh, Arlene Sharp and, and Gordon Freeman actually showed that it had two ligands, PDL1 and L2, and was actually another checkpoint. Um, different in that, as, as Li Ping Ching had shown, shown earlier, it, it's ligands induced on tumor cells by gamma interferon. And then that means that T cells, which come have specificity for a tumor and come near them, make gamma interferon, they upregulate, the tumor upregulates PDL1. Um, it, binds to PD-1 and through the T cell receptor, we think turns them off. And so it also, both these drugs worked in a wide variety of patients. Uh, not exactly, um, I can talk about some interesting differences, but, but anyway, both of them worked in, you know, not just melanoma, but lung cancer, um, you know, bladder cancer, uh, head and neck cancer, throat cancer, cancers, a lot of cancers that were caused by uh, mutations. I'll, I'll come back to that, that later. But in any event, um, this, this shows some of the data from a phase one trial that Suzanne Tapalian carried out. Um, so here we have two the, the response rates with with PD one are a lot are are um, the responses are faster because again it works on terminally exhausted cells as shown in the cartoon, um, but but also not complete. Um, so what do you do? Well, the obvious thing was to put them together. So Mike Curran, when he was a postdoc in my lab at Sloan Kettering, combined them in mice and he showed they're at least additive. And this actually is not the most recent follow-up. I thought I'd update this. But anyway, um, this is a combination trial done by, the Jed, led by Jed Walchok that was started um, eight years ago now. Uh, and the survival there is still over 50%. Uh, with, with no additional treatments after this early period. Um, and so um, that's quite an improvement uh, from the 3% that you got with the monotherapy with, it, with IPI or the, uh, or the survival that was obtained with, with PD-1. Um, but, but I think that we could start to think about curing cancer. Um, in melanoma, that, that, again, we went from a... a, 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 a disease in which only 3% of patients would be alive here, up to more than half being alive and, and essentially free uh, of worry, many of them that, that I've met, um, which is, well, given that for a while, but an obvious um, you know, benefit for quality of life in those patients. But it's not just melanoma. This just this is a partial list too. It's, there are too many approvals now and different indications to put them all up here. But IPI was approved in 2011. Uh, and then um, Merck's PD-1 in 2014, Bristol Bar Squibb's PD-1 in 2014 later. Uh, and then the combination of IPI and PD-1, the melanoma based on the data I showed you and others uh, in 2015. More recently, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, PD-1 has been approved with another molecule called LAG-3. Um, and this is, other than that, there really haven't been any more different molecules. These, all of the, the, the things shown here are, are other PD-1s or maybe one or two of them are other uh, C24 antibodies. Um, but in any event, there's, there's survival of that, um, benefit and not just melanoma, as I said, but lung, renal, colorectal, head and neck, lymphoma, hepatocytic, it goes on and on. Um, but these range from 15 to, or to 25 or in the case of bladder, um, maybe 35, 40%. Um, but lower that, and then, and then some cancers like pancreatic um, and, and uh, glioblastoma really haven't uh, um, responded very well. There's some hints lately 
uh, that give us some some hope, but not, haven't responded very well. So we've still got a lot, a lot of work to do. And so I think one of the things that we've decided to focus on is really understanding how these drugs work and others so that they can be combined in a way that makes sense instead of just randomly as, as seems to be happening in a lot of cases now. Um, I'll spare you my soapbox for a little while. Uh, in any event, so it's, it's useful to compare the properties of these. I mentioned CTLA-4 is hardwired. It's involved in every immune response, every T-cell response that you get. ED1 is an induced resistance mechanism that thought plays an important role in protecting the developing embryo from destruction by the maternal um, immune system, uh, and that tumors have co-opted it some way. I said CTLA-4 works during priming, or sorry, targets CD28 co-stimulation, and therefore works during priming, uh, whereas PD1 seems to work on the T cell receptor pathway. There's a little bit of controversy there, but I think the overwhelming data suggests that that that's the way it works. Uh, works on fully differentiated effector cells that can make gamma interferon. That's how it's induced. Anyway, because of these differences, PD CTLA-4 blockade um, can, can expand clonal diversity. Um, we showed a long time ago, Cynthia Chambers in my laboratory in Berkeley in the 90s showed, um, and others in the lab using a variety of, pat of peptides of different strengths that CTLA-4 can lower the threshold um, of avidity of a, that a peptide MAC needs to fully activate a T cell. You know, and that has the effect of expanding clonal diversity where PD-1 just seems to reawaken those differentiated cells that you already have um, and it allows them to work. Uh, again, because of those differences, c 4 is often slow, PD-1 rapid. So I'll show you c 4 in monotherapy primarily affects CD8s, um, excuse me, CD4s, um, although in combination CD8s and PD-1 as monotherapy absolutely only affects CD8 T cells, although I'll show you it could also affect CD4s in combination. Um, I, I'm not gonna have time to show you the data today, but uh, Pam Sharma in the immunotherapy um, platform here at Anderson has shown that CTLA-4 can move uh, T cells into cold tumors, immunologically cold tumors, such as pancreatic, and then instant, and some bladder patients that have cold, but PD-1 cannot do that. Um, again, adverse events with CTLA-4 are quite frequent, much less so with PD-1. And also this begins to give us a hint that there's something more fundamental going on because disease recurrence after CTLA-4 is very rare. Um, generally, you know, if you make it that three to five years or so, it, that's it. But disease recurrence after responses to PD-1 are significant and can be, you know, 35 to 20, 25 to 35% after two years or so. Um, and another difference is the way they're given, uh, and this will become important later. Um, and, it, and again, it's because of how they work, but CTLA-4 blockers are given usually just a few times. Uh, partially that's because of toxicity, but mechanistically that's maybe all they need, as I'll show you later. Whereas PD-1 um, is given, depending on the supplier and everything, the, the, comp the company, um, repeatedly as often as two weeks, sometimes for as long as two years or until patients, until patients progress. So again, a number of differences between, between these two ways of treating cancer. So Spencer Way, when he joined the lab a few years ago, um, decided to, this was when Cytop was relatively new, so I'm not going to explain to you these days uh, how that works, but basically we have a Cytop panel uh, using all 43 um, actually 44 possible um, uh, flags, um, which comprised of, of those to eliminate and the data I'm gonna show you uh, just to exclude cells other than T cells and then have the major differentiation markers and um, antibodies to um, uh, transcription factors uh, that delineate different types, functional types of, of T cells. Um, and also markers for proliferation for cell death uh, things like that, so that we can really get an idea of what's going on. Um, and we also kept track of all the, the, the data uh, in individual mice as we were gathering it so that we could, we could correlate um, the changes that we saw with, with the, in, in phenotypes with what's going on in the tumor. So I'm going to show you data 
Billy got using the MC38 tumor. This is a methylcholanthrin induced colorectal carcinoma, very high mutational burden, uh, very much like human melanoma, actually. Um, and it, it uh, responds very well to CTLA4 and PD1 monotherapy, blockade monotherapies. Uh, we also did the experiments with the B16 BL6 tumor, which responds very poorly. And we had to use a vaccine along with, the, with that tumor, um, which has very low mutational burden. Um, and any anyway, event, but the, the data that we got, the, the, the cell types involved in the mechanism was essentially the same in both. And we also did some human patients, um, although not as extensively as the mouse, and, and, it, and it replicated best as we could tell in humans as well. So just to show you the annotated different clusters of cells that we saw. Now we've got to spend a few minutes on the Treg cells because this needs some explanation. But anyway, there's two kinds of FOXP3 positive um, uh, CD4s in this analysis, KLRG1 positive and KLRG1 negative, these being the more mature, we think. Uh, these are definitely depleted by anti-CTLA-4, at least by 9H10, which is the antibody that we made in hamsters that we're using in these studies. Uh, whether or not it does anything to these um, butter, probably naive cells, uh, we're not sure. But anyway, it definitely um, depletes these functional ones. There's also some decrease in the numbers by PD-1, but I think that's by depletion. Anyway, the absolute numbers of, of T-Rex, of course, is associated with bigger tumors because they're inhibitory. But so far in the work that we've done, um, in humans, at least in melanoma and bladder, where we've looked pretty extensively, as has Tony Rebus in melanoma, we've not seen any evidence for this going on with, with ipilimumab. Um, and it does seem, and Alan Corman is really, and Mr. Bash Quibb saw the same thing. We could deplete Tregs and mice models, but it doesn't seem to happen in, in humans. Um, but I'll just, I won't show the cartoon again, but there is this cell intrinsic pathway that, that uh, Arlene Sharp and my lab both, both studied extensively in the 70s. So um, before the Treg um, thing was discovered. Um, so there is a cell intrinsic as well as this extrinsic way. So in humans, only that extrinsic one is functional up to date, but there are efforts being done now to, uh, by a number of groups trying to, um, make um, CTLA-4 antibodies in humans deplete Tregs, which is not that hard because they have about two logs higher CTLA-4 than effector T cells and therefore can become targets of antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity by macrophages in the case of mice and humans in the case um, of, of patients. Um, anyway, so Tregs mice, but not really in humans. If you look at CD4s here, there's basically two different types. Um, these seem to be, again, naive, unactivated cells. Uh, but a major population of what we call TH1-like is expanded, as I'll show you here, um, by ipilimumab, uh, but not by PD-1, as shown here in the, in the, in the blue and, and green uh, dots here. Uh, and we call that TH1-like because we know from other experiments, they make gamma interferon and TNF-alpha, uh, and they have TBET, uh, but they also have ICOS at, re, at pretty high levels, um, and it makes them stand apart for what you normally see is effector CD4s uh, that you're used to seeing in, in virus studies and, and, and normally. Uh, so I'll have to come back with that. But these cells are uh, linearly associated with smaller tumors. If you look at the CD8s, what you see is that there are really two populations where the numbers are associated with smaller tumors. These cells, which are effector cells, they have some PD-1 because they've been activated. They have CD69, TBET, other activation markers. But, but these are conventional um, um, effector uh, CD8 killer cells. These are expanded by NICTLA-4 and also by PD-1. PD-1 doesn't do anything these CD4s, but does expand these effector cells. Um, and then there's this other population, which I'm sure everybody knows about, is these cells that express high PD-1, TIM3, LAG3, so three major co-stimulatory molecules. Um, and these cells are considered exhausted by John Wary and, 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 and other, uh, others, um, and uh, have, have epigenetically uh, been changed to be 
more or less permanently, although there's some debate about that, uh, locked into this phenotype. Um, but CTLA-4 doesn't really touch those, but PD-1 um, does expand them um, a bit. And so I just point out that these cells still have that phenotype when you give the antibody. So these results agree with uh, the work of, of John and many others. Um, and and uh, so this is, I think, why you have to keep giving the antibody because they could, and we know from these studies that while the antibody's there, they'll proliferate. Um, but when you take, when the antibody goes away, they'll stop proliferating. That's why you have to keep giving it maybe until that last tumor cell's dead. So this just summarizes it uh, with CTLA-4 again, these ICOS uh, TH1-like cells and these effector c 8 expand. Um, and then in PD-1, these differentiated effectors also and these exhausted cells. Um, but of course, the, since the combination is now uh, becoming the predominant treatment um, over the monotherapies in many cases, the question is what happens when you put them together? Uh, is it the same or is it a modification or something completely different? So we'll go through this same thing. We had another group which has combination therapy. So let's just look first at these uh, exhausted cells, PD-1 high, LAG-3, TIM-3. They're not expanded by CTLA-4, but are expanded by PD-1. And again, are associated with smaller tumors. Um, if you add CTLA-4, you actually see that the number of those goes down significantly, way down below control of untreated mice even, um, and below that of CTLA-4 alone. So something's happening to those guys. Um, and I'll come, and um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but if you look at the terminally differentiated cells uh, that are expanded by CTLA-4 and, and PD-1, a little bit more by CTLA-4 than PD-1, when you do have a combination, you expand them a lot more, as you might expect, because you're, you're um, having the effect on them during priming, but also um, taking, taking, uh, you know, the, taking it off after activation with PD-1. So just to go back to the exhausted cells for a minute, um, this is what uh, the, the Spearman coefficient is if you look at association with tumor volume, negative association, either an untreated or PD-1 monotherapy, but when you add C to like four, um, they not only, as I showed you earlier, do the numbers decrease, but they become irrelevant uh, to the clinical activity. Um, so a bit of a surprise, and, and, uh, but if you look at the ICOS positive CD4s, again, those go up in combination therapy even more. The biggest expand uh, from, from CTLA-4 are working during priming, but also again, because they activated, they have PD-1, it expands their ability to, to proliferate um, after activation through inhibiting the PD-1 that's on them at that point. Uh, so any event, uh, you collapse this, this you know, two cell type uh, slot with one different with the monotherapies down to this ICOS positive CD4s and just the effector cells, not the exhausted cells when you do the combination therapy, which, which has some implications, I think, to the way this is done because now uh, patients get an initiation you know, um, dose of both antibodies and then uh, they have maintenance doses of PD-1. Uh, which, which may not uh, be necessary, uh, depending on what's going on with these cells. Um, and so the question is, you know, what really happens to those exhausted cells? Are they converted back into CD8 effector cells? Well, um, I think uh, since they're epigenetically fixed, that may be um, difficult. John, John Wery, uh, I think, thinks that that's not very likely. Um, uh, but others think it, uh, Andrea Scheidegger, I think, thinks that it might be, uh, if they're not completely fixed. Anyway, it's an open question right now. But I think an, another possibility that I find very interesting is somebody who's um, interested in just the fundamental importance of, of co-stimulation um, is that maybe you can prevent exhaustion by, uh, if CD28 co-stimulation is readily available because you continue to block C to like four, um, and have to remove its inhibitory effects. So you have even more robust um, CD4, uh, CD28 co-stimulation. So uh, we don't know the answer. We're, we're looking for mechanistic signals. But I want to talk a little bit about these um, inducible co-stimulator positive cells. Um, ICOS is a member of the CD28 CD4 superfamily, as is PD1, as you can see here, the phylogenetic tree. tree. 
uh, it has its own ligand, ACOS ligand. Um, but of course, the immunologist, when you see a CD4 cell with ICOS, you say, well, it's either a follicular T helper cell uh, with BCL6 and, and involved in, in TH2 cytokines or, or, um, or got a three with TH2 cytokines and class switch uh, recombination with B cells, et cetera. Or it's one of the, the, the regulatory FOXP3 positive CD4s that, that make IL-10 because it regulates IL-10. Uh, but their role in cancer uh, was first shown by Pam Sharma in 2006 in a neoadjuvant trial that she was doing a ripilumumab in uh, bladder cancer way before it was even approved. Um, so uh, what she found there um, in the cl her clinical samples from the tissues, this, this was a neoadjuvant sample because it was a workaround at the time. Uh, you really weren't able very easily to get biopsies from patients on trials for research studies. You could only get them for uh, you know, prognostic or diagnostic value. Uh, so Pam pioneered the use of, of um, not, not only neoadjuvant studies where you give them before and after surgery, but also in these studies doing, um, doing the studies before surgery in patients with localized disease that were going to be treated by their surgery, um, namely patients with, with pancreatic, sorry, excuse me, with, with prostate, bladder, and kidney cancer that were going to removal. So in bladder cancer, she got the whole uh, bladder after surgery by giving them a couple of doses before they went in for the standard of care um, and was able to look at what went on. One of the things she found was that three of the 12 patients in this small trial were, were um, cytogenetic and uh, pathogenetic uh, uh, complete responders. There was no sign of tumor when they finally went to surgery. In any event, um, that, that finally led, that led later to uh, a, a full-on clinical trial, and, uh, which led to the approval of these um, for treating bladder cancer. In any event, what she noticed was there's a two-to-fold increase of, of these ICOS positive C4s in tumor, but also in blood. Um, and that she showed by using um, NYE cell one as a model target that the patients whose tumors expressed NYE cell one and had CD4 positive T cell specific red wing, so on, those that produce gamma nephron and TNF alpha were all in the ICOS positive fraction of CD4 cells by, by flow cytometry. And then um, while right after she made this observation, this was while the, the phase one was still going on, she shared that data with, with um, uh, Jed Walchuk when, when uh, I was still at slow Kettering. And what Jed and Pam found was that um, the sustained increase of that phenotype, they had to be up for, for the entire treat, period of treatment with surgery, or there was no clinical benefit, there was no survival benefit whatsoever, suggesting that it's at least a pharmacodynamic marker of VIPI's biological activity. But subsequent mouse models, that I'll, well, I'll just show you the, the mouse models here. So the question is, is this really playing you know, a role Having made that observation in, in the patients, we can take this system back to the clinic and, and, and test the hypothesis that it plays a role um, in the clinical activity of, of nfc 4 This shows um, with, this, uh, nine, with this B6 model I told you about where you use a um, GMCSF expressing vaccine with it, um, cure 85 to 90% of the mice. But if you do that, same therapy at mice that lack either ICOS or its ligand, you lose half, at least half of the therapeutic benefit. So that shows that, it, that ICOS does contribute um, to the, the clinical activity of, of uh, c 4 And so we wanted to go on further and ask us, is, could you uh, use ICOS as a target to increase efficacy? And, and so we collaborated and made this uh, vaccine where we um, altered the cells, these B16 vaccine cells to express ICOS ligand. Uh, and so the experiment is pretty obvious. We just gave the mice tumors, treated with nsc like 4 with irradiated just vanilla tumor cell vaccines or with the tumor cells, which had been transduced to express ICOS ligand. And then looked at what happened. And what you could see here, it's very interesting, is these are all the monotherapies, but this is the the, ICOS, the vaccine that does not have ICOS ligand. And this is where you have ICOS ligand. You go from 
a little over about 25% efficacy back up to 90%. So you get a tremendous boost of the therapeutic effect by, by engaging ICOS. And this is through ICOS signaling because if you do exactly that same experiment in mice whose T cells do not have um, ICOS, having that receptor around doesn't make any difference. It does require signaling through the ICOS molecule to realize that, that clinical benefit. And so this is a potential way to benefit. So, um, oh, we do have some work from Naveen. Now we recently submitted this. So uh, we wanted to look and see what happens here. So we looked at uh, single cell RNA sequencing to look at what happened in CD4s and cd 8 So just to orient you a little bit here, Tregs up here. Um, does look like there's some depletion when you treat with anacetylate 4. These are the effector CD4 cells here. Uh, these, these TH1-like effectors that you see when you get acetylate 4, these red populations, you can see those are greatly increased um, when you have IVAX around. Um, and and uh, the complexity of those goes up. There's additionally even more uh, functional type of those. If you look down at CDH, what you see, again, it's almost a dip disappearance of the exhausted T cells and an increase in the effector like CD8 cells. So big bang through the buck in both CD4 and CD8 responses when you add that IVAX to the CTLA4 um, backbone. If you look at myeloid cells, it's also very interesting because here, with all the, the clusters, these digitic cells here, uh, monocytes and macrophages here, uh, these seem to be the suppressive kinds uh, with arginase and other inhibitory genes. Um, and these down here seem to be the more inflammatory type. But if you look what happens with the combination, the inflammatory, sorry, the suppressive uh, myeloid cells both almost go away and uh, you greatly increase these, these uh, inflammatory myeloid cells. So this combination therapy uh, really shows you improvement both in the T cell uh, compartment, but also the myeloid compartment, I think, which um, again provides support for doing this and also looking for ways of additional ways of influencing the myeloid cell. So, one of the things that was curious about this was you know, you see this with NRC4, we did not observe these cells in mice treated with NRC for PD1. And so we went back, and, and that's if you just looked at simple uh, standard color, you know, multicolored flow without all the markers that we had for the cytop. But if you go back and you use those markers um, and look at what happens when you knock cells out, you get this pattern. So these are wild type, C4, wild type, and heads in green and blue. Um, but if you knock it out, you've got these patches of cells that don't exist that we can't detect at levels, you know, at about a half percent or percent, maybe be generous, including particularly this, 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 um, uh, continent down here, which is not connected with the mainstream at all, mainland continents at all. You know, very, very different, almost Australia-like its isolation from uh, from the rest of T cells. Uh, so just to show you what those are, the cells which are not detectable uh, are these clusters here, where the, the blue and the green uh, are on this axis here, uh, uh, undetectable. Um, and so there are four types of those, as you can see here, this one, this one, this one, this one. And if you look at what they are, these are precisely those that you see in the mice treated with NSC4 or are the patients treated with NSC4. You can also not find these cells if you do the same analysis on PBMC from humans. So these cells don't appear to exist normally, at least, unless you either, unless you get rid of ICOS, sorry, of C4, either with an antibody or genetically here, as I've shown you. And when you do that, you generate this new phenotype of T cell, which um, is, again has TBET, so it's a TH1, has ICOS, it makes a lot of TNF alpha and gamma interferon. You also have these other three, and I'm not going to go into it, but it's just some time. Um, but this cell has B cell six, got a three, and ROR gamma T, three different major transcription factors, which according to the textbooks shouldn't be in the same cell. But those cells, Spencer uh, came up with a, with a way of sorting them. Um, and um, they, where we could recover the cells for functional studies. And they're making all of those cytokines actually. Uh, so, you know, some new cell types in the CD4 population to, to think about that, that are present when you don't. We've not confirmed 
these other three with antibody treatment. This is the only one that increases enough by antibody treatment for us to see. But again, back to for those non-immunologists, this is an immunologist view of T cell development. They come out of the thymus uh, as naive cells with CD4 with a class two restricted MHC receptor. And depending on uh, the signaling pathway that they get, the kind of cytokines that are around, um, the strength of signal, et cetera, it's pretty complex, but you end up with cells at the end of the day that, you know, this is a partial listing of them, but that have a particular transcription factor that regulates cytokines and different cytokines adopted, you know, adapted to, to different functions. Um, and again, TBED associated with, with gamma interferon and in, in these cells that we got. And something I'll point out is that, is, is that Kim Bottomley in the, in the, um, in the, in the uh, 90s, uh, as soon as the TH1, TH2 static uh, paradigm had been established, she showed that stronger TCR street, signal street, everything else being the same, tended to drive cells towards a TH1 rather than a TH2. Um, anyway, so I'll come back to that in a moment, but what our data suggests is that it's really not quite this binary or as simple, and there are probably intermediates that might be what we're capturing. Uh, but we think what's going on, um, you know, we're, we're, what we've ruled out is alterations in the thymic development. The thymus from the c 4 knockout mouse is absolutely indistinguishable in any way from wild type thymus until the cells have exited and undergone priming. Um, we also don't see any enhanced proliferation or activation leading to these cells. And so it seems to be the deregulation of phenotypic constraints may remove barriers, which constrains the types of the, the, the fates that are available uh, normally to, seek life, to, to developing CD4s. And we think that may be due to um, removing CTLA-4 um, which allows effective, uh, more effective CD28 co-stimulation. If you think about it, the TCR signal is a combination of the, of the initial um, TCR signal, which the, uh, along with the amplifying signals from CD28, which has been shown uh, to do essentially the same genes, just in more quantities. Uh, we think that this may, uh, by removing that constraint, you get cells that that have this supernatural, if you will, I don't mean Halloween, I mean a, a, a levels above what would ever happen in nature because you never have an absence of CTLA-4 genetically. Uh, you may have various levels of it, but it's never absent because that's lethal. Um, with the antibody, you can inhibit that. And we think you're removing those constraints and revealing these new T cells. So anyway, and it suggests also that those other cells, that we should, that there may be you know, some back and forth is suggested a long time ago by, by John O'Shea and the late Bill Paul. Uh, but in any event, it tells you that you need to really think about what's going on when you treat with a drug that especially, you know, that can affect the differentiation of T cells. Um, having said that, having said that, I will point out that there, in, if you look at the CD8 compartment of C to four knockouts, there are difference in ratios of different C to like four uh, of different CD8 types but there's none that aren't found in germline. And if you knock out PD-1, uh, again, you see difference in ratios, but you don't see anything appearing that wasn't uh, in wild type or in heads uh, there. So this, what I've just shown you, is unique to CTLA-4 uh, knockouts, which again uh, is, I think, because of where it works in T-cell development, it works the earliest steps of priming rather than on functional aspects of the cell after it's been terminally differentiated. Anyway, so this last thing that I, I talked to you about is that people, this memory. And so one of the things that people have noticed is that C4 um, does seem to be uh, the durability, have more durable responses. So uh, Stephen Mock in the lab has been addressing this for a while now. Um, and this just sort of, sort of shows what you can get if you give this irradiated tumor cell vaccine, no live tumor cells, um, but in a PD1 PD or C4 and wait 70 days or so, and then give them uh, tumor cells, what you can see is that um, the, the naive cells, the T cells, the tumor cells grow pretty fast. With PD-1, they're slowed somewhat, but uh, with C4, most of those mice are totally immune and reject the tumors. Uh, but there's, problem, there's perhaps some problems with residual cells. So we did it also with irradiated cells, that, a different kind of vaccine that didn't have GMC and CFM actually basically observed 
the same thing. But a purist would say, you still have to worry about tumor cell bits, um, and especially if you did this with live tumors, little micro metastases, so you get a continual stimulation. So we did the best we could at irradiated. Um, sorry, this is, this is just go to, cut to the end here. It, um, immunized with peptides, uh, ovalbumin peptides, and then, and then test the responses um, with using tetramers. And what you can see here is the initial phase, and then after memory, when they're rechallenged just with, uh, with just with peptide, what you can see is the recall response with CK4 is much higher than it is with PD1, which is barely better, better uh, than wild type. And if you take those cells um, from there and, and transfer them into mice, and look at look actually. Excuse me. If you take those cells at the end of priming, which is about right here, and ask what's going on in those cells, what you see is a pretty startling difference that we think may account for this. And that's by measuring uh, um, TCF1 and, and tox levels. And you can see here with CTLA4, um, the predominant factor is TCF1, uh, PD1, very few of the cells um, have TCF1, and the reciprocal is true. When, when that initial bump was with, with NIPD1, very few uh, TCF1 positive cells, um, mostly tox positive cells. And we think that may be the fact that makes them more powerful. So if you take those cells, the ones that had more of the TCF1 than the tox, and you transfer them on an equal cell number basis, then rechallenge the mice with the tumor expressing uh, over this, the first time tumors ever been in that mouse, you can see that um, those that uh, that have the higher tox levels much more capable of really getting rid of the tumor than those that that sorry TCF much higher than those that have predominantly tox. So I think it's this ratio of the fact that T that CTLA4 even in the early response induces more um, cells with TCF. Um, than with talks explains this memory thing. And so anyway, I'll just close there and um, and just point out that, that this figure, um, much to the dismay of a lot of us in the field, is not very different than the one that we would have shown you in 2011 or 2014. The only molecule besides CTLA-4 and PD-1 that's moved over into the FDA-approved category is LAG-3 that I told you about. It's part of this I mentioned earlier, it's part of this triplet, uh, LAG3 and TIM3 and PD1 that are really highly expressed on, on, on uh, um, exhausted T cells. Um, the other, real, others really haven't moved, even though these molecules uh, in in vitro studies and often in preclinical studies um, look like they're pretty powerful, uh, including some new ones. Uh, one of the ones that we've been looking at and I have um, are, are predominantly myeloid cells expressed members of the LILR family, LILRB2 and B4. Um, and so um, we've been, uh, we've shown that LILRB4, for example, is not only on inhibitory myeloid cells, as are these other two, Vista and LILRB2, but it's also on a subpopulation of Fox P3, Fox P3 positive regulatory cells. Uh, and which lose their regulatory ability in, in LILRB4 knockouts, and so do myeloid cells. Anyway, uh, so we've got all these possibilities, and I think that um, what we need to be doing is more combinations, but analyzing them in a different way. So there are trials going on now, um, about 3,000 at one check, one count a few years ago, of PD-1 plus other things. And the, the, the standard way was to take two things you know, and, and do a clinical trial, 50 patients or so, and see if you get a, a clinical signal. And I think that's a lot to ask when we know some of these molecules, like Vista, for example, doesn't even appear to be induced until after you've given CTLA-4 or PD-1. So a lot of these molecules haven't had single agent activity, so they're not tested that way. You wouldn't expect them to because they're often not induced until you give another checkpoint. But everything changes after you give a checkpoint. So just giving two things together and asking for a clinical response is asking a lot. Um, but again, we now have examples that I've shown in the mouse of the positive things like ICOS. Uh, anyway, we're, we're beginning to see more conventional therapies. More recently, there were uh, combinations with surgery 
um, in, in these uh, um, neoadjuvant trials, both in melanoma and in lung cancer have had response rate as high as 70% by beginning. And it's very important. So it's been shown to be very important to start with the checkpoint blocker prior to the surgery and continue it afterwards for maximum effect. But that's a really promising area. And um, I think that um, as we uh, come up with ways of changing the way that, that uh, chemotherapy is given, uh, and that radiation is given, so you don't try to kill that last tumor cell and in the process kill all the immune cells. We could make them more, more friendly and try to use those uh, conventional therapies as vaccines. I think we're going to see um, a lot of power in those kind of conventions and perhaps targeted therapies as well. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to do, and we still need to base all this on basic fundamental understanding of basic fundamental biology, not just of T cell biology, but myeloid cells and other, other um, um, members of the adaptive and, and um, innate immune system. But, but I think where, what we've learned is that, you know, for the, since the dawn of the age of chemotherapy, oncology has been taking large amounts, large numbers of patients, treating them and seeing if a statistically significant number of them show higher immediate survival. IPI was the first uh, uh, immune-based drug to do that, again, four months of melanoma. But it also had a 10-year tail on it. Plus, actually, there's a couple of patients now that are 20, one of them's 21 years out uh, and no, no retreatment. Um, this one is, is, uh, is an aspirational line. Uh, instead of concentrating on this, we need to be working on, on combinations um, that are done along the way that, again, that, that uh, I'm sure I'm on the immunotherapy platform and pioneer that is treat a small number of patients with standard care, Take get biopsies, look at what happened. There's a new checkpoint, take that back to mice so or anything significant you observe, a new um, transcription factor, and a new um, 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 genetic regulator, uh, epigenetic regulator, and then just take them back to mouse models, see if there's any effect, and then bring them back to patients. Again, I think we're gonna have to use that kind of intensive scientific study to, to do this properly and re reach that goal. Uh, but the good news is I think we know it can be done if we just you know work, work hard, pay attention to basic biology and, and learn from it. And, and um, that we, we can reach a point where we not only raise the response rates to the tumors that, that I've shown you and talked about, but also done something in glioblastoma and pancreatic cancer. So with that, I'll stop and uh, thank you all for attending. As I understand, there's no questions. So um, that's it. There'll be some questions on um, Twitter, I suppose. Anyway, I yield. Yeah. Th thanks, Jim. That was wonderful. The, the differences in memory are really exciting. Uh, makes me think about um, a couple of things like, you know, potentially different dendritic cell interactions or the, um, differences in maybe PI3 kinase signaling that yeah. might be emanated by um, blocking CTLA-4 versus PD-1, because that would be a fun, you know, a major um, regulator of TCF. So that's really, really cool. Thank you so much for sharing this. Yes. Yeah, so please ask your questions uh, to, to Dr. Allison uh, by Twitter. Uh, you can go to his own Twitter site at Jim Allison PhD or go to the um, Global Immuno Talks. And we will try to get uh, those answered for you over the, the coming days. Um, and again, Jim, thank you so much for your time and for um, talking to the world. And uh, love, we're just very, very, very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.